Welcome everybody. Glad to have you all here today. My name is Devin Fulford. I am the Director of Education and Content at the Davis Finney Foundation. And I am so excited to be here today with this panel of women who are going to talk to us today and talk to each other about their experience as a woman living with Parkinson's. So we'd love to just start with some brief introductions. And Jasmine, I will kick it over to you to get us going. Hi, my name is Jasmine Stir. Um, I am I live well, I live in Los Angeles with my wife and our cats. Um, and I um I'm 29. I have kind of a, a crazy diagnosis story. I have juvenile onset Parkinson's, um, and I got this mutation from my dad, who was also recently diagnosed with regular onset Parkinson's. Um, same mutation, just different severity and onset. Um, I was diagnosed. Uh, well, my symptoms started when I was 14, um, and then I was diagnosed with dopa-responsive dystonia, which is um, a metabolic disorder that mimics Parkinson's. It uses the same medication when I was 18, um, and so I took Cinemet for two years, um, but I progressed, and people with dopa-responsive dystonia don't progress, so I was diagnosed with Parkinson's at 20, and then I had DBS at 21, um, and it's it's been kind of a, a crazy ride since then. Um, I also have significant GI issues from Parkinson's. So I have um, dealt with living with a feeding tube um, and I've used IV nutrition to get to where I am now. Um, and so that's, you know, kind of my diagnosis history. It's been a good 15 years. Um, uh, yeah, that's where I am. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Tell us one amazing thing that has happened to you so far in 2024. Right. Um, okay, so actually, one exciting thing is I'm working on a med tech project of a, a formula I've developed for feeding tubes um, to soak up the leakage that were, um, exudes from feeding tubes. Um, and so I've been working on that for a couple of years to get it onto the market. And in uh, two weeks, we're actually going to launch it. Wow. So it's exciting. exciting. Congratulations. My is science and chemistry. Oh, wow. What an accomplishment, Jasmine. That is so cool. Thank you. Uh, Sandra. Hello, my name is Sandra Chu. I'm 35 years old. I'm from Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. I was diagnosed in 2020, just, just before my 32nd birthday. And one of uh, the great things that has happened so far this year has been joining the new group of ambassadors for the Davis Finney Foundation. Uh, the Davis Finney Foundation was definitely one of the first resources that gave me that glimmer of hope that I could live well in my new norm. And just thinking back at how I felt in that dark hole that I was in, in when I first got diagnosed and to know how I feel now, it's just, it's night and day pretty much. So it's really nice to be a part of this organization that gave so much to me at the beginning of my diagnosis. I love that, Sandra. Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you. Karen. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> my name is Karen Frank. <laughs> I'm St. Louis, Missouri. I am 53 years old and I was diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's when I was 47. I believe that I have um, had it for a lot longer, which is many people's story. Um, my father had Parkinson's, his mother had Parkinson's and her sister had Parkinson's and I have a genetic variant for Parkinson's, the GBA mutation. Uh, I used to work as a nurse anesthetist in my career, and I was unable to do that anymore because of my Parkinson's. And I have found that since my diagnosis, I've gotten involved in many, many things, mainly related to my work with the Davis Finney Foundation, but other organizations. And I've stepped into a role of leadership in my community with people living with Parkinson's, people um, experiencing young onset and middle age Parkinson's, I would say, actually. And uh, the most exciting thing that's happened to me this year is I took on a really big challenge that I was feeling a little bit intimidated about. And I'm hosting a large event in St. Louis um, to benefit the Davis Finney Foundation, but to introduce our community to pedaling for Parkinson's. And so I'm planning uh, over 400 riders riding stationary bikes to work toward learning about the importance of 
high quality exercise and pedaling for Parkinson's. And I've, I've never done anything like this. And I just jumped in full speed ahead and I'm enjoying it actually. Oh my gosh, that is amazing, Karen. Uh, thank you so much for your support. And I am so excited to hear how this event goes. I wish I could be there. It sounds so much fun. <laughs> I'm going to be there. Yeah. You're going to be there? Oh, cool. On a bike. So anybody come to St. Louis and, and ride a bike with us. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, Terry. Hi, I'm Terry Lamers. Um, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I am 48 years old and I was diagnosed um, at 42, just a month shy of 43. Uh, my symptoms early on were relatively benign. Like I literally, if you saw me, you just thought like maybe I had extra cup of coffee, I had a jumpy knee. Um, people would catch me kind of walking away from something and think like why I was limping. And then most noticeable, I get home with the family. Um, we'd be sitting around to do like a movie night or something and I would just be really, really tight. And so it'd almost be like when you try to flex a muscle at the gym, you'd be like, I'm so tight and I'd have to tell myself to relax. And then literally like two seconds later, I'm all tight again and I have to relax and it would just be constant. And um, that's kind of what got me to go in and check out and see what was going on. Um, in retrospect, I probably had anxiety for a few years prior to that. So it's kind of relief to find out that that was the symptoms and that actually helped curb it right away. And then also kind of unique, I guess, to my story, because everybody's story with Parkinson's is so different, is... Um, Thankfully, initially, I didn't want to try medicine. I was going to try a bunch of different things first. But when I did get to the point to try, um, nothing that I tried worked. And we tried three or four different things. Um, and so that led me kind of down a path to try a lot of more complementary things early on, acupuncture, sacral cranial stuff, um, probably much sooner than I did. And that was wonderful. But it still wasn't a lasting help that I was looking for for pharmaceuticals. Um, and I got to the point, um, 2022, where... I was really, my quality of life went off the edge and I was not able to do much with my kids and my family. So we were going to do DBS and then kind of on that process, you do the meds again. And this was my third time doing the carbidopa, levodopa, which is kind of the gold standard. And this time, six weeks in, it actually worked. And besides exasperating my symptoms, it started like slowly getting my muscles relaxed and helping. And it's taken about a year or so, but I've been able to get back into where I can walk longer distances. I've actually started to jog as, as of last summer. So it's been really exciting to have some symptom relief way above and beyond what I would ever expect. You know, I will take that little glimmer of hope as long as I've got it. So, so I've kind of had a roller coaster like everybody, but I'm in a really good spot now and I'm happy to help share and want to help promote living well with Parkinson's with everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Oh, thank you so much for being here, Terry. Tell tell us one great thing that's happened so far this year. Um, so far this year, it's just kind of a mix. I'm trying to reemerge and kind of juggle my life again after having kind of got away on the sidelines. So I have um, younger kids. I have two high schoolers and a tween. So <laughs> between their stuff and just trying to be more active in the Parkinson's community through Davis Finney as an ambassador and I'm a local front. I'm just kind of putting a lot of things together and figuring out how to balance that. So it's been really exciting so far this year. This is a lot of big things in our local area and a bunch of women's initiative locally here too. So really excited about that. Very cool. Thank you so much. And Patty. And Patty Burnett from Summit County, Colorado, which means I live at about two, two miles high, 9,100 feet, almost two miles. But I um, used to supervise the ski patrol at Copper Mountain and trained avalanche dogs. But when I was diagnosed, um, I was 60 years old, and that was 11 years ago. And um, I had tremors, and I had a good idea that that was probably Parkinson's because my brother was diagnosed about two years before that. And we both, we grew up in a laundry and dry cleaners where TCE is pretty popular, which is one of those no-nos as far as um, potentially contributing to Parkinson's. They're almost positive about that. Trichloride ethylene or something like that, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the first seven years of my of my diagnosis, I didn't take any cinnamon at all. Um, just took some other supplement type of stuff. Well, no, some prescription as well, but cinnamon seven years after I was diagnosed and and it helps some. So I've had DBS and um Terry, what you were saying about hope, that's huge. Being able to help other people, like through the Davis Finney Foundation, makes a big difference. You know, it takes my mind off of my own issues and helps me to concentrate on other people, what's going on with them, and help them. 
Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Patty. Oh, 2024. Yes. I have four grandchildren. Jackson's five. Let's see, Noah's almost four and Maverick's almost three and Emerson is almost a year old. And they're the best thing about 24, but also um, we got a motorboat so I can water ski a little bit. Ooh. But that's great. That was a good thing. Oh, that's a great thing. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you again so much for being here today. Um, so let's jump in. Let's just talk generally speaking. When you think about your experience living with Parkinson's and being a woman, what does that mean to you? I think women in, in general live with a lot of issues, obviously, that are different than men. And myself being in midlife, um, I actually had my last menstruation a year before my diagnosis, which was kind of young. So I've been in menopause I'm pretty much ever since my diagnosis. And there was a lot going on at the time that I was diagnosed as for all of us. And my story was similar to yours, Terry, from what you described, just really early intolerance to medications and possible early DBS and that kind of thing. But I think in general, uh, as a woman, I, I have found that there's so much overlap between these issues and it's hard to sometimes peel those pieces of paper apart and figure out what's Parkinson's, what's, uh, you know, hormonal, what, is just aging and dealing with um, issues that relate to as we grow older and having a chronic illness and looking forward to your future and that kind of thing. So it's hard to, to pull apart for me. And uh, that's been a challenge and continues to be a challenge sometimes. I can relate to that about, I've become way more introspective mm -hmm. and more questioning about the future I don't know if guys feel the same way or maybe they do, but they don't express it very well. But for me, for sure, you know, I, I, I feel like, I don't know, before, before diagnosis, I would live from day to day, didn't care about the future. And now you kind of wonder, well, what's my future hold, you know, and what can I do to change that? Is there anything I can do to change that? <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So in my case, I had my first uh, tremor, uh, visible tremor, about a month prior to getting pregnant. And so once I started inquiring about, hey, you know, what is this, you know? And because at that point, it was intermittent. And then as my pregnancy progressed, uh, and I got into postpartum, it be it got to the point that it was a constant, very painful tremor of my whole arm and of my whole leg. And going to the doctor and having them say, oh, well, pregnancy takes a toll on your body. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the stress of it all and being disregarded and saying that pregnancy was ca causing these involuntary movements of my body. It was very frustrating to say the least. And it, and I feel like Parkinson's has really made me uh, value and the the time that we need to take as women for our self-care, because mm -hmm. I know growing up in, in uh, my household, it was a lot of the, oh, uh, don't complain, just muscle through. You have your kids to think about, you have your spouse to think about your household, and you're really not much if you don't take care of yourself. And mm -hmm. Parkinson's definitely has showed me that because since my symptoms got significantly worse at the end of my pregnancy and into postpartum, having an infant mm -hmm. and being in those repetitive motions with an infant 
with my very uncomfortable tremor and trying to be steady, st as steady as possible while breastfeeding and all the playing and chasing around your child, like that caused a lot of pain for me. And knowing now how much of a difference my pain is when I exercise and when I stretch and when I take that time for myself, it's it was definitely a big learning curve uh, as a new mom and and to to know how to balance that out of hey, I do have to take that time for myself in order to better take care of my family. Sandra, I think that a lot of people, I mean, we know postpartum depression is a very real thing. Mm -hmm. and depression with Parkinson's is a very real thing. How did yeah. you work that off? How did you handle that? So definitely that first year postpartum was just it's hard to think back during right. that time because it was, uh, it was my, my emotions were just all over the place. And I, I don't think I had a uh, postpartum depression, but I definitely had like postpartum anger that was hmm. just not my norm. Prior. So I had a lot of support from my husband, luckily, who uh, who is also in the medical field and was very understanding of me and and very supportive. But it was it was really hard to not feel like I was I was uh it was almost like an out of body experience just to try to um try to handle the the new changes as a, a mom trying to figure out my child and not knowing what was going on with my body and being disregarded uh, when I did try to inquire about it. I did finally get my diagnosis when my daughter was 18 months. So it it almost was a relief to know that somebody actually believed me and uh, that there was something that I could do to help myself be uh, stronger and and regain that control of my body. It's mm -hmm. it's I think um, and, you know, it, it, it's a little bit. I was ironic to talk about this because we're we're coming from a place where we're talking to two people who are already diagnosed. But when you wait a while for a diagnosis, it's hard. Mm -hmm. I mean, the four years before I got on cinema were just like maddening, like trying to get doctors nice. to listen to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I was tested for like a hundred different things. I was tested for MS like 12 different ways, you know. Um I as you know, four years of just doctors trying to figure it out. Um, and also, I love that we like jumped into you know the hormones right away. Mm -hmm. um, I could talk about that for days. Um, <laughs> I I have had so many issues with my with my Parkinson's and um, and hormone hormonal changes and uh, menstruation. So you know, I I started my period only a little bit before I started getting symptoms, uh, and very early on. Every time I'd have my period, I'd have like extreme leg pain. Um, and it would, my legs, I, my Parkinson's in general is much more on the rigid and dystonic side. I have a very mild tremor. Um, and uh, it would be like my whole body would just like lock up and just be so stiff and painful. Um, and when I was 15, I told a neurologist that it was worse. Like my symptoms were way worse on my period. And that was the excuse he needed to write me off and to tell me that, oh, you must just have endometriosis. Sometimes it can affect people's sciatic nerves. Um, and so I was given hormones that put me through menopause for a year when I was 15, which was just like, didn't help any of my neurological symptoms, but did make for some really awkward moments in high school. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, and it's just like that, that whole thing. And then when, once I was finally diagnosed, finding out that like every premenopausal woman during their period has just like crazy neurological symptoms just made me really angry. Um, but it also helped me because when I was, when I did finally get my diagnosis and I took a bad fall on my period um, in my first year of college and um, other women are said, hey, you know, I have a marina, gets rid of my period. It's great. Um, and so I, I I went and at that time they weren't really putting it in people who hadn't had babies yet. Um, but my doctor and just, just really in quickly, Jasmine, in case anyone doesn't know, yeah. that's an uh, that's an IUD. IUD, yeah, yeah. intra you know, yeah, intrauterine device. Uh, it gives you hormones for five years. Um, now it's up to seven or eight years. Um, but it, uh, I'm on my second one now. I'm just going to have them until I'm dead, basically. You know, to just keep. Um, to keep me from experiencing that because when the first one ran out, I started experiencing and I started having all that pain all over again. It was like, I'm not doing this again. Um, you know, so I got it replaced the next day. Um, and it's like, okay, but to find out that like, that's something that all these women experience. And, and I've dug through the scientific literature and it's not something that's been studied. It's there's been a couple studies in the eighties and nineties, but it's just not something that I feel like doctors know about. Um, even more seasoned doctors um, or it's not something that is ever really talked about within the Parkinson's world. And I think it's because partially, you know, it's a minority of women who are premenopausal when they're diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that it's something, and I can imagine that menopause probably brings its own hormonal changes and challenges to your symptoms. Um, oh, but, yeah. you know, I think that's <laughs> very untouched. Yeah. yeah. My menstrual cycle has always been like clockwork. So then when I started noticing that my symptoms and the effectiveness of my medications lined up with what time of the month I was in, I was like, whoa, this is literally clockwork with my symptoms and with the effectiveness of my medicine too. I had one movement disorder specialist initially that I had told this to, I told him when literally the day that my period starts, my symptoms and my, the effectiveness of my medicine gets significantly better. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then about those two weeks prior to my period, it's so much different. It's worse along with other non-motor symptoms. And he said, oh, okay, well, I've never heard of that before period. And so it seemed like it felt like he disregarded, you know, my experience. And uh, once I found another movement disorder specialist and told him the same thing, he said, wow, I had never heard of that before. But how about we adjust your medications so that you can help yourself since you can feel like when you're your medicine isn't working as well so that you you have the flexibility to adjust your medicine accordingly and i felt so seen and it just really did help me during those periods of the month that you know i do need some extra help from my medicine this so. is a really good example where you're saying that so for me i you know i think for me it was during menstruation that my symptoms tanked and so yours was the opposite you had during the ovulation the period yeah but that's the thing. It's like every body is different, and but it's still tied to the hormonal cycle. And I think that's Absolutely. a universal experience for women. And to throw in the, the loss of your hormones and the menopause, <laughs> that's sort of threw me for a loop because at the same time that all that was happening, I was having trouble. I tried hormone repletion because I thought that would feel better, and I went to my gynecologist about it. And I wasn't absorbing any of the medications through many routes that I tried. I tried pills. I tried shots. I tried cream on the skin. I tried lozenges, which were supposed to be absorbed in the oral mucosa. I tried, I, I probably tried five or six more things. And my levels just kept dropping and dropping and dropping. And finally, somebody said, well, maybe it's all the medication you take, uh, the amount of levodopa and other medications. Cause for me, I've had some psychiatric side effects of Parkinson's on the non-motor side. And I too take multiple medications to help with those issues and they work. But I think that my body receives so much medication that I wasn't absorbing the hormones properly. And I finally ended up 
trying the pellets or bioidentical hormones where I, I've been on them for about a year, but I went for a good four or five years between the psychiatric medication that I was taking, the menopause onset, the Parkinson's mobility issues. I wasn't enjoying my intimate life with my husband. We were undergoing the stress of a new diagnosis, a new marriage actually, because we got married after my Parkinson's diagnosis. And you know, I couldn't enjoy um, intimacy anymore because it wasn't working for me. And to finally get a solution for that and doctors to sort of listen and try to come up with an outside the box thinking on that and find a solution just brought a lot of joy back into my life and into my marriage. And, you know, we faced early on in our years, I mean, about we, we moved in together after dating for four or five years and six months later, after we bought a home together, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and lost my job and, and went into menopause at the same time. So it was challenging. And now, you know, six, seven years down the road, I feel so much better. Uh, all of those multiple issues being balanced. And it's nice to have a group of women even now just to sit and talk about these things. And I hear so many common themes in my story and your story, whether you're younger, uh, childbearing age or older about not being heard, not being seen, yeah. listened to. And a lot of finger pointing about it. It's not, it's not your pregnancy, for example, it's, or it's not, you know, neurologic, it's your pregnancy. I got a lot of that, you know, go to a urologist to figure that out. I'll go to a gynecologist to figure that out. Nobody said higher bodies. You know, that's, and I think neurologists so often are like, okay, if it's not your brain, I'm not treating it. <laughs> you know, yeah. and it's like, okay, this affects like literally everything. Do you guys You're think that we're, we're disregarded more if we have a, a male MDS rather than a woman MDS? What do you think? I think so. Yeah. Possibly. I know I ended up with mostly females on my staff at this point. Um, and, and the gentlemen that I had seen, the doctors I had seen before, they weren't terrible, but I think, you know, they happened to also be old school neurologists. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I even brought it, cause I kind of felt like I was my spokesperson. Like I'd be like, Oh, by the way, I just would always weave it in. Like my symptoms are worse around, um, you know, my period. And um, just thinking that that was an important information to pass along. Um, both off medicine and on medicine, it would affect it. And um, it was amazing how much more receptive the women were to that. And, you know, obviously a little bit more because they could understand it themselves. Um, and then it was, and they could realize, it kind of help you kind of sift through again, where do you go to, is it your neurologist? Is it OBGYN? You know, like who, who is the person for that problem? Can they work together? Can you problem solve on your own kind of a thing? Um, but anytime hormones and emotions kind of quote unquote come up, it's just, unfortunately, it, the stereotype sometimes rings true that it's kind of then shoved off to the side. My doctor's the man, but he's um, amazing. Like, and, and I think that's, it's, it's the thing, you know, I, I, I think they're a little bit rarer. <laughs> but I've had a couple of really great male neurologists, and I think it, it really comes down to whether they're going to listen to you. And I also think it also is just sort of their ethos and philosophy on Parkinson's as a disease. You know, like I've had a lot of doctors who were a little bit more old school in that whole kind of like, you know, like the the, the willingness to listen to. And, and also, I mean, you know, my doctor does talk about it, the, the whole, okay, every so often to look at it, make sure it is Parkinson's and not something else that should be evaluated. But um, just the willingness to be like, okay, I can, I can acknowledge that like you're having this experience and that it's affecting you in this way. Um, and it could be something that I haven't seen before. It could be something that is less often less common and you know and it could be something that i need to go learn about myself um because you can't know everything and i think that the the, the what really makes a good doctor is i'm willing to say i don't know everything but i know how to find anything yeah. and i know how to send you somewhere when i need to find outside help one of the things that i'm hearing so many of you talking about and saying it without saying it is that you have to educate yourself and you have to be your own self-advocate Absolutely. What would you Pretty suggest for people who don't have that capacity, for women who don't feel comfortable being their own self-advocate? Because not everyone feels like they can do that. I, I sometimes say I don't really understand how you survive in healthcare if you don't 
um, learn about it and take into your own hands because I feel like they would have killed me by now if I hadn't. Um, and, you know, just to be completely frank, I, I genuinely feel that way. Um, you know, for example, something like I've had, um, I've been in the hospital and they've come, I've had a nurse come to me with saying, oh, the doctor prescribed you Reglan, which is a prokinetic drug that is extremely dangerous for people with Parkinson's. And if I didn't know that and I let her give it to me, that could have, that, I know somebody with Parkinson's who has given that, who said that it basically sent their body into like three days of fits, um, you know, and just like horrible spasms. And it's like, if I didn't know that, that could have happened to me. Um, and it's like having, if, if, if you can't do it, having an advocate in your corner, which is really difficult, finding some way to learn about it. Um, I, I feel extremely privileged to have science education. If you can get someone to help you, if you can't, who can, um, you know, just be able to, to at least keep up, keep track of everything, um, be able to help you organize your thoughts to present to doctors, learning how to present yourself to doctors is a whole skill I did not know until I was like much after I started this, like being you able had to, to learn so oh. young. So you had, so, and I was so bad at it. it. Oh know. my gosh. I was so <laughs> bad at it. Like I looked at my old medical records and I, my, so my pain was one of my first experiences, um, pain and like motor difficulty in my leg. Um, and I tried to explain this pain cause I, I had never really felt anything like it before as um, it's almost like when you get pins and needles, but without the numbness mm. and in all my charts it says numbness. And I said, without the numbness, you know, it's like, okay, I was trying to just explain to you what I was feeling, but I didn't have the words. Um, and so, you know, I tell people like, if you can log your symptoms, if you can video record them, we didn't have smartphones when I got sick. Um, you know, um, if, if you can, if you can record them, if you can log them, if you can write how you're feeling when it's happening, so that way you can present them something because you have like 10 minutes to explain weeks of what's going on to you um but being able to communicate learning how to communicate is like like they should they should teach a class on this really. <laughs> well in yeah. fact patty would you like to talk <laughs> about pd cell <laughs> yeah we need to educate the doctors but pd self is parkinson's disease self-efficacy learning form is that right it. yes anyway I went through this thing like eight years ago when I was new, relatively newly diagnosed. And back in the day, you know, we had these big notebooks, but I was really blessed to, to have as instructors, Jess Barr, who's from UC Health. She's wonderful. And um, a guy named Hal. And they're the guys that same do the video even today for PD Self. But it's, it's eight modules and you go through it and you learn all the stuff about how you can be your own your own advocate, because you have to be every time you go to the hospital, you have to be every single time. And so you need to educate them. It's amazing to me that when I got, was diagnosed in Summit County, nobody knew anything. Of, none of the doctors knew anything about Parkinson's. I went to this neurologist that was a joke in Summit County. And so, yeah, we what we do is in this class, we tell people the important things like exercise, of course. And going to your doctors, like you were talking about, Jasmine, that kind of stuff. Do you want to talk more about it, Devin? You know more than I do. Oh, <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, everything you said is right on. It's a PD Self is a self-efficacy skill building program, and it is offered for free through the Davis Finney Foundation. Uh, we just took over the program and launched it in late January of, of 2024. Um, Patty and her husband, Dan, are two of our uh, cohort first cohort facilitators. So they have a class on Friday afternoons. Um, the class, this first cohort does go through um, May, and then we kind of take a little bit of a break and we're going to do some revamping of the program and we'll launch a second cohort in August of this year. So if you guys, then you're it's interested for people in that were recently self. dead. I'm sorry. Okay. That's yeah. okay. <laughs> it's for people, people who are diagnosed within the last few years, right? Right. Yes. So the way their program was originally structured is that it's for newly diagnosed people within one to three years of a diagnosis. And when we do relaunch it in August, we're going to expand that out to include yeah. anyone who wants to take the program. Um, it just it doesn't really make logical sense to me to 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 make it so constrained. I mean, people live as, as most of you on the screen have said you lived with your symptoms for 
probably longer than three years. And even if you get that diagnosis, you might not be ready to take a course in self-efficacy. So you might be seven or 10 or 20 years into your journey. And I think the program should be open to everyone. So come August, 2024, it will be. When, when you were talking, Devin, about how if you don't have that sort of comfortability about advocating for yourself, how do you go about that? I, yeah. You know, my nursing background always taught me to advocate for patients. And so um, that's allowed me some skill and experience advocating for myself. And also, Jasmine, like you said, the medical knowledge to navigate the system and know how to work that system. But if you don't, my, my thought and suggestion is things like this are so important because hearing others talk about their experience of doing that for themselves, it builds courage. It gives people ideas. So we also have a great ambassador program at the Davis Finney Foundation, and there are 130 plus ambassadors in English and Spanish that you can lean into and discuss these issues. And some of these people have navigated these issues themselves and are great sort of guides or mentors about how to maybe overcome that anxiety or trepidation about being more forthright with your care team and building a care team in general, because our care team doesn't just involve our neurologist. It involves other specialists, other people that are non-conventional, like, you know, we heard Terry talk about acupuncture and craniosacral therapy and all of these other things that work for some people. And that's important to build that team around you. But I think if you're not naturally bold, I think it's time as you hear this message to sort of begin to work on. Well, and then jump on that, what you saying too, like if, if you don't feel comfortable with yourself, print out an article, bring in a, a website, a resource like this and share it and just say, hey, you know, I have some questions about this. Um, I'm kind of more of a naturally outside the box curious thinker. So I was always kind of thinking of what else could I do? Like if here there's no cure, what what else can I do? They can't know everything, right? Like ex let's explore. But other people they just want to show up in the doctor, get the pill, go home and, and just take, do what they're supposed to do. And there's nothing wrong with either version of that. It's just kind of what your comfort level is. And, but you, but you utilize resources to bring it in, bring a person with you if you don't feel comfortable. That's also helpful for someone to take notes perhaps too. Yeah. You can remember kind of what was said at your appointments. So that's never a bad thing either. Yeah, I spent 10 years working as a nurse in the hospital and in the community setting. And it was really hard to hear just how many people thought that they could not chime in mm -hmm. at a doctor's appointment that what the doctor says is the like the only thing that could be followed like that they could not question uh, a doctor that has formal training versus somebody who maybe you know like I know personally uh my parents came from rural parts of uh, El Salvador, and they thought that you could not talk back to a doctor, that you could not ask questions, that everything that they said and did was, you know, what you did. And it's, it's sad to know that because as the patient, you are such an integral part of your healthcare team. And if you do not chime in with your experiences, whether it be with the medicines, with, uh, with what's going on, I mean, that, that's huge. Karen can tell you, nurses keep doctors in shape. They keep them <laughs> humble. And, you know, you guys do a great job letting them know what's what. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's also great as a patient when you can educate too, right? I always take it as like, maybe my symptoms sharing, my symptoms or what happened to me will help them with the next patient that they see. Because each each physician is probably only seeing a handful. And in my community, how many young onset? And then of that, how many young onset that are women? You mm -hmm. know, so it's kind of lower and lower. So the more symptoms and experiences you can share, I just am always helpful that it helps the next person. So then the doctor's like, oh, I, I've, you know, I've heard about that before, or, or maybe they look into it further. I don't know if you guys have this experience, but, you know, our appointments are so few and far between, and they are short for the amount of uh, life that we deal with living with this disease. When you have 
15, 20, 30 minutes to go in and address all your issues. And sometimes mm-hmm. I walk away from the appointment with more questions than I came in there with. And I'm <laughs> because I know I'm not going to see that doctor for another six months or 12 months, maybe even 18 in my community or 24. So I, I almost have, I, I do a lot of preparation before my appointments, but this always seems to happen to me. I get nervous. I sort of zone out a little bit during the appointment and I'm like, oh, as soon as they walk out the door, I think of five more questions and I know I can send them on the portal, but yeah. I think I, my balloon gets depleted a little bit and I lose a little sense of empowerment in that moment because I feel that those short interactions are so important and so uh, fleeting. And I don't know in your communities if you experience this uh, similarly, but that's an experience I seem to have. And I've been dealing with this now for about seven years and it's just hasn't gone away for me. Do you have any tips? I'd be curious too. It's huge for me to, to get on the patient portal and ask the doctor all the questions that I have ahead of time, because they're way better at responding to that than any other means, I think, at least for me personally. So you've all mentioned some really important strategies for preparing for your appointments, for making sure that you make the most of your time with your doctors, um, for following up afterward. What would you recommend to um, single women, women who don't have a partner who can come to appointments with them? It's important. A lot of hospitals have, have patient advocates, don't they, Karen? They do. I don't know if they're that accessible to people to come to an appointment with you. I One of my, my thoughts about this, uh, I was, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Patty, but I think making friends with Parkinson's, being willing to enter the community and be involved in support groups, because it's not all about people. To me, support group is not, you know, uh, whining. <laughs> At least my support group isn't. Uh, it's given me a sense of power. I mean, I have a, a woman who's single, who's undergoing an evaluation for DBS. She was worried about going to the appointment alone, and I offered to go with her. And I think that was helpful, but I, that community wouldn't be there already for her if she hadn't put some time into developing some friendships and relationships with other women who have Parkinson's. And you know, I know a number of women who are single and dating and dealing with Parkinson's. And that's an issue of one friend who has horrible facial dystonia. And she's always like this. Oh. And she's afraid to, to be seen by men, um, is really wants a partner and is afraid of that. So I, I think there's a lot of ways in which single women have, uh, to find other sources of support to, mm-hmm. um, deal with not only doctor's appointments, but all kinds of issues. Mm-hmm. Sure. And confidence is so hard mm-hmm. um, with that. I definitely went through that um, before I was married, um, you know, trying to to gather the confidence. And and also, it's all, there's also vulnerability. Um, I think that uh, you know, we've talked about this, right? Women want to put on a front. We're very strong. <laughs> You know, we we accepting help is difficult. Um, learning how to accept help is an entire skill in its own set. Um, and um, if, you know, it, I also think it takes a special person to be with somebody with Parkinson's. Um, and you know, and and that sounds patronizing, a special person, but I just mean somebody. Not everyone has that um, emotional bandwidth. Mm-hmm. And um, I think with with my wife, I knew that we were gonna be great when. She absolutely handled like a champ of the hospital <laughs> well, pretty early on. You know, we were talking all night long and I was like, oh crap, like my I'm having significant GI issues. I have chronic intestinal pseudo obstruction from Parkinson's, um, which is a more rare complication, but not that rare. Um, and so all of a sudden it was just like, oh, I am in a ton of pain. I like really need to go to the hospital. And she's like, all right, cool. Like, you know, we'll get through this. Um, and she talked to me through the whole thing. And I was like, okay, cool. You handle this like a champ. Like you're, you'll be fine. Um, and it was kind of like a thing we both needed. Um, but, you know, it's like knowing and I, in, in relation to what, knowing when a person is like not going to have that bandwidth, it's not worth my time to continue. Um, um and also to know that there's other ways you can contribute when you're not 
you know, feeling well, like you don't have to be able to, you know, lift 50 pounds, but there's lots of ways that you can emotionally contribute. Um, you know, when I can't do a lot of housework, I do other things. I make phone calls. I take care of, you know, computer stuff. Like there's lots of ways that you are valuable and useful, even if you don't feel it. Sure. So finding those, finding that confidence from that is, is like, you know, a whole skill set in itself. And one that like, we have to continually work on and develop none of these skills. I think that like when people like us present, we seem polished and together and like, well, it's not true. I'm an absolute mess most of the time. Um, but you know, it's like those, those skills didn't come overnight. It's been 15 yeah. years. Um, and it's like, we were, they're still not there a hundred percent. It's something that we work on every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point, Jasmine. And, and also it touches to something, Karen, you mentioned about your friend who has the facial dystonia. So I just wanted to ask everyone about there, as women living in 2024 America, we all have certain expectations put upon us, right? And we all know that Parkinson's impacts the way that we present to the world around us. So if you feel comfortable sharing, maybe what have been some of the more challenging things that you've experienced, either with yourself or with uh, someone in the Parkinson's community that you know, as far as appearance, feminine appearance, um, or things like caretaking that tend to be very women-centered occupations, but maybe have been changed or challenged by your Parkinson's? As far as appearance, I kind of feel like I'm aging a lot faster than my peers. Most of the people I hang out with are a little bit younger anyway, but, but I feel like I'm aging so much faster. So my husband is continually telling me I'm beautiful, which I know he's just lying, but anyway, yeah. he's pretty sweet that way. You know, a good one. <laughs> kind of need to hear that because things, things are aging a lot quicker. I, I feel, I don't know if, you know, statistically they've proved that, but I think it's probably so. Well, you look fantastic, Patty. Um, but I feel the same exact way. And I can, I look back at pictures and I'm like, I've just been like, I've just been worn through so much life so quickly. And like my muscles are tensing and I, I never, I was one that I'm not overly hung up on wrinkles. I'm always like their laugh lines it's because I've lived life. But now I look in the, in the picture, like at pictures, I'm like, oh my goodness. So I'm like, so I don't want to see that. Or I'm getting the facial masking and I'm someone who's known or historically I'd be a smiler. And if I wasn't smiling, people would come up and be like, what's wrong? You know, mm -hmm. like, you know, like, and now I'm like, people are having to get used to that. I'm, I'm not smiling very often. And I have to think about maybe I should raise my eyebrows so I don't look like I'm growling at somebody. <laughs> and yeah, I'm in the mood. It's, it's, it's a hard adjustment, let, let alone the little silly things like not being able to wear high heel shoes because I don't know how I'm going to feel in an hour. Can I walk back out of the room? You know, I can, I can stay in there for a little bit, take a picture. And that, you know, those kind of little things that's, that's fine. But, but if, when I'm, when my meds are not on, I'm always like, I'm 96. So if I think of it that way, the things I would do at 96 and the things I would wear, I'd wear the supportive shoes and some stretchy clothes and, and maybe not do as many athletic things, you know, then I'm fine, but I'm 47 most of the time or 48, you know, and so, yeah. so it's, the flipping back and forth is, is, is kind of, kind of rubs your ego the wrong way, but most days I'm okay with it. Just here and there kind of, you have a bad moment. Well, since yeah. I've had this hairdo by DBS, I notice everybody's hair. Because I used to have kind of long, nice looking hair, and it's kind of changed a lot since then. <laughs> I lost my hair in DVS too. I, I went full bald, and then I had the, the, the hats and everything. <laughs> and, and I, I was really thinking yeah. I was going to get DVS. So I was like, I just keep it growing until I had to shut it. And then I didn't. So now I have to figure out what to do. But <laughs> eventually, I figure they'll be down that path also. Yeah. And, you know, there's tons of support when you do. Um, I was so amazed by how many people who had it before me who were who were like, hey, like, you know, I'll, I'll call you and tell you about my surgery. And that was so helpful. Um, so important um, because it's scary. <laughs> um, but also like the best thing I ever did. You know, that reminds me of something. Do you, do you guys feel like the doctors don't, um, give you the opportunity to say no to DBS. There are some that would say that doctors don't, they ignore the needs of women more than men. 
Hmm. Maybe that women are afraid to get DBS or what do you think about that? I was, I, I needed it when I had it. So I can't talk on that. <laughs> it was like very necessary, but um, I've heard women say that though. I've heard lots of women say that. And some people have also talked about, I know some, some people, um, one doctor told me that it takes two years to get comfortable with the idea of DBS because it's like brain surgery, you know, literal brain surgery. It takes two years to get, especially, um, you know, they're doing more sleep surgeries now, um, but some are still awake. Doing it awake is, you know, which is what I did is, is kind of like, it, it's a lot. Um, and so the, the idea that it takes you two years to, to get into your mind, the idea of like the acceptance that it's going to happen and be a good thing. Um I do think that, you know, it, it's it's something that is very individualized. Like, it's not for everybody. It's for a lot of people. Um, and at a certain stage, some women have said that, you know, I want to have it earlier, so that way it helps me longer. Um, and so I don't get to a bad place before I had it. Personally, I wish I had it before I was in such a bad place. Um, it would have been easier to recover from. Um, but so I have not had DVS, but I'm curious what the recovery period is like shortly afterwards, because I'd assume like in if I were to have it like now as a is as, as a mom of a young child, like what does the recovery period look like? Because I do take care of my daughter and and I would need to know like how we would need to adjust. You need a month uh, of help is my opinion. The, yeah. I feel like you need more than that. Yeah. I had it in August, my first surgeries, and we're still doing pretty frequent programming sessions. Mm -hmm. And you'll be doing programming sessions for the rest of your life, basically. Mm -hmm. But they'll be fewer and farther between. Um, but how old are your kids? Do you my have daughter's five. Yeah. Seems like your symptoms aren't too bad yet. No, uh, yeah. So that's not something that I've considered yet at this point. But I, as like maybe other women who who do have younger kids or are single moms, and would need you know help with care. Like I, I'm just curious. Like you that initial. It's usually about three days in the hospital. Okay. Um, which honestly is almost still too short. Um, and then a couple of weeks after it, like I'm it's more like just the immediate recovery, mm -hmm. um, you know, dealing with medications, there's, there can be sometimes a bit of a halo, like the, the honeymoon period, which I, I had, and then it tapered off. Like I initially felt really good after surgery and then it tapered off and then I got programming and then it got better again. But, um, and it can take people a long time to get programming. I was pretty lucky in getting it or like getting a decent one on my first try. Um, but that sometimes that can take people months to get a good thing. But I think as far as like the initial surgery, it's about a month of kind of feeling pretty bad and like, like having a hard time getting around right after you just had your head open. Um, um, I think that it's just, it takes support. Like it it takes um, just people to help you with the things that you're not going to feel good enough to do. Yeah. Yeah. And answering your question, Sandra, I, I personally reach out to me because I know some people who dealt with that as single parents, as single women with school age children, but uh, there is a Facebook group for young onset Parkinson's who are dealing with the DBS time of their diagnosis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Facebook groups, but that happens to be one. And I think you might find folks in that stage of life who have had to navigate DBS with uh, mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. which, bring, which brings up, sorry, um, kind of just the caregiving in general, like whether it's DBS or like you're trying to start new meds and it's, you know, the process as you guys are aware, but not everybody is when you go on a lot of the Parkinson's meds, it's like a slow ramp up. So maybe it's three weeks up, then you decide, does it work? No, it doesn't work. Now it's three weeks back down. And mm -hmm. like in the meantime, you've got life, you're working, you're raising kids, whatever it is that you're doing, like kind of still keeps going. So having a support team of some sort is helpful. And I know for myself, it was really hard because I'm the support. Um, I was yeah. home with the kids when they were little. I was getting ready to go back into the workforce and I never ended up officially going back because of my diagnosis. But I'm the support for everybody else. So then what happens when when mom needs support? And, mm -hmm. and my role as a mom is just different than it was before. 
Yeah. yeah, and also, you know, like, okay, is, you don't want to turn your kids into caregivers, but at the same time, like, kids can also help in ways, like, you know, like, like, it, it, it's it's okay to, to, for them to do some things, you know, like, I think that I've seen Absolutely. a lot of parents be, Absolutely. I'm at the point, too, where I don't have kids yet, we do want to explore that option, not carry by me, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, and we're thinking about adopting, um, and there's that kind of burden on, like, okay, you you feel guilty like i i have had to like work through if 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 we and i want to adopt a child do i feel guilty about how my illness is going to affect being a parent um and dealing with that but it's like you know it's like okay your experiences too it, it, i i do think it's also character building to have somebody in your family that has gone through health things they're going to be more compassionate to other people um, and I think that a lot of parents uh, feel feel a lot more guilt than we should, than like you need to be carrying and then you should be carrying because it, it's not your fault. Um, but, you know, it's it's like I, I have also seen a lot of kids um, grow up with really good values because of their parents' experience um, when you would approach it with, you know, an empathy for them as well as an empathy for yourself. Mm -hmm. I think it stems back to the, like, I'm, I'm really bad at receiving help myself. I'm much better. I'm recovering. Um, so it's hard, even though I, I like to help other people and I want my kids and my family to have the opportunity to, to help me in a way that they can help also, but it's, um, it's harder in the, in reality than it is in theory. And I, I guess I always thought I'd be the one helping my husband or my kids and continuing that role that way, but you just never know what life's going to bring you no matter what. True. Hmm. Yeah, we've incorporated with our daughter, like the word self-care. Oh, mommy has to take some time for my self-care in order to be a better that. mommy and a better a wife and a better person. Uh, so when I'm getting ready to go exercise, she said, oh, mommy, you're going to go do your exercise medicine. And yes. she, <laughs> she knows how important that is for me, that that is as important as taking my medicine. So I completely agree where, you know, at five years old, you know, she's understanding these concepts that you know, it took me until I was an adult to really like. Focus she can have and empathy for other kids, too. Mm hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, there's a focus, I think, generally speaking, on self-care in society these days, and it can look so differently for everyone. But again, as women, it's not something that we necessarily feel comfortable prioritizing mm -hmm. for ourselves. So how how do you make space for that? In a way that feels genuine to you. Um, almost, part of what I do is when I exercise, I'll do it with other people. Mm -hmm. And I figure that, you know, I can help them maybe a little bit. They can help me a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I think I think it's really important for us to not withdraw socially, mm -hmm. which I've had to do for about the last month because I had a broken hip. But it's getting better. But when you're not when you're not healthy, you you um you can go downhill pretty quickly. I like what you said about what I can do for others as well. So one thing that I've noticed in my relationships is that like, for me, feeling like I'm contributing helps me accept help. So it's like, and it's funny, my, my partner has essential tremors. It's actually like, I don't how we met, but um, so, you know, like she they can't open things very easily and I, funny enough i actually and sometimes neither of us can but like you know so like sometimes like i'm like oh hey like i'm actually the one who's got the better motor control right now like that's wild <laughs> um but me for me doing things that like i like contribute i feel like okay it's easier for me to let her help me when I've done something and and, and you know and, and learning to accept that like it it doesn't have to look big it doesn't have to, you know, like if cooking dinner is not going on, I made a phone call, I did something else, like, you know, like contributing in ways that I can and like putting value on that and like, you know, kind of doing that mental work on myself and saying like, okay, like I am, you know, I'm not freeloading here, um, you know, and also just unlearning that toxic mentality. But like, you know, if you can find ways to like accept, like to 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 feel like you're contributing in your own way with your own abilities and accept your abilities for what they are and accept your value for what it is and to put value into that 
that value. Um, that that really helps me be able to be taken care of. Yeah, I think we have to value ourselves as well. You know, often women are the last one in the family to get, you know, everything. I remember when I was on a budget trying to be with the family and it was like everybody had new clothes, everybody had food that they wanted to eat, everybody had books they needed. I didn't have anything left. <laughs> and it was just, that was assumed, you know, that I was sort of last and <laughs> we can't look at ourselves that way. And I think developing stronger boundaries without being a or it, that it's okay, you know, to be respecting ourselves as much as others and developing space to take care of ourselves and yeah. ask for that. From I can see like within this group, we've all done sort of that mental health homework. Um, yeah. Addressing your mental health early on is something that I wish I had done sooner um, <laughs> personally, because uh, I think I was always very like, I, I'm somebody who can just kind of like put, uh, myself into work and avoid my problems um and uh, I, I wish that I had like addressed my anxiety and depression um I wish I'd gotten on medication sooner for me um MAOI inhibitors have been my magic depression cure because I got serotonin syndrome from <laughs> SSRIs uh, but uh you know finding the medication that helps me like cope with life um and you know having gone through some therapy and stuff and just having dealt with my mental health challenges was like something that I think that is so easy to not deal with yeah absolutely I think some of what you all are focused on right now and talking about the concept of um, connection and reciprocity in the way that you're contributing to something and and it it sort of doesn't matter what it is as long as you're feeling the value, as you put, Jasmine, I think that's super important. If you heard anyone say anything today that really inspired you, connected you, or anything, you, and you want to reach out, these women are here for you, and and you can connect with them, um, and they and they would love to talk with you um, about anything that you are struggling with, or or even celebrate with you if you're having a win and you just really want someone to share it with. You can connect with everyone here today as well. Uh, we have spent an amazing hour together, and I just want to say thank you so much to all of you um, for being here, for sharing your experiences. Um, to sign us off, if you have just one final thing that you'd like to tell the community about being a woman living with Parkinson's, now's the time. It's four o'clock. Um, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's great timing. That's my computer that did that. I know it is. I remember it from PD Self. It was just such funny timing. If you want to tell them that, uh, anything, you will tell them what? I will tell them it is four o'clock. Four o'clock. <laughs> I think I think one thing that we need to remember as women with Parkinson's is we need to remember our superpower. Our superpower is coming together as community and working together. And I think that's super helpful. I think like we mentioned during our time together that Obviously, there isn't a lot of scientific evidence for women with Parkinson's and young women with Parkinson's. So learning about yourself, like those body scans, getting to know like your symptoms and just mm -hmm. advocating for yourself in any way that you can to because there isn't a lot of that scientific evidence to back our experiences up. So make sure to to say what you feel because it is valid in your situation. I would say my contribution to this would be that no one needs to be alone with this disease. We have a, a large community and if you're brave enough to dip your toe in the water and even just make a phone call to an ambassador or make a friend with Parkinson's, somebody that can be your phone buddy, that changed my life as two or three women friends who I met who had Parkinson's. And I know anytime I can call them when I need to chat, because I know a lot of women do need that mm -hmm. piece of chatting about things to process stuff. That's been invaluable for me. So lean into the ambassador program if you don't have that yet and you'll find it. 
Yeah, no, connection is everything. Um, and like I said, I've been kind of unplugged from the Parkinson's community the last couple of years just because of the pandemic and my own mental health and everything. Um, and yeah, no, it's it's so important to to have that connection. Um, and it's 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 a part of self care to to do that connection. Um, uh, and it it's it it it's just it's it's so helpful. It changes everything. I think in the years that I was undiagnosed the 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 biggest piece missing other than just like obviously treatment was feeling alone with it in the world like that there wasn't anyone who understood me what I was going through um and just to, to piggyback off of what Sandra said about um the lack of sort of like scientific documentation if you find yourself in and I found myself like too many times in in an area where um it feels like uncharted waters where um, there isn't a ton of things, but there will be someone out there who has had your experience. So connecting with the wider Parkinson's world, when my GI stuff is particularly severe, because like you know I do uh, rely on a feeding tube um, because my stomach just doesn't move enough. Um, and uh, there's a, a medication called Motegrity that has really, really changed my life in the past couple of years um, that I had seen a doctor who had had uh, experience with it and who had, who had dug deep into the research and discovered that it, it you know, had been really extensively studied in the beginning for intestinal tube obstruction. But my neurologist now has like a ton of people with Parkinson's on this medication because he's seen that it's helped me overall with it. And because everyone with Parkinson's has some level of GI dysfunction. Um, but that isn't necessarily something that's, you know, known and studied, but it's getting out there because we're talking about our experiences. So if you find yourself in uncharted waters, you find yourself in experiences where it doesn't seem like there's a lot of people out there who have gone through it and your doctor doesn't necessarily know it. Someone does and someone's doctor knows about it. Somebody has had this experience with Parkinson's. Um, and the more that we talk about these experiences, the more that the next person who is finding themselves with a symptom that, you know, is causing particular problem in their life um, and they don't have necessarily a way forward, um, we'll find that way forward through your sharing your experiences and you're talking about it to your doctor who, you know, will get it to the next patient. Like medical science is going to be behind us because it can't move as fast as us. The process just doesn't work that way, but until we put it out there. So that's my piece. <laughs> Help the next. Thank you all again. This has been a really wonderful time together and uh, your insights and, and lived experience are so important. So thank you so much for sharing.